Hello and welcome to our Pagasa Center Bible Study Night. And tonight we will be continuing in the letters to the Colossians that Pastor Benpour Nadurata will start uh, facilitating the lesson. And to all of you, avid students, lovers of God, lovers of His Word, welcome and I thank God that you are here. And I pray that you are all focused, that you will gain something out of this Bible study night. And to all of you, our VIPs, our guests, welcome. And again also, I pray that you also will receive something out of this Bible study. All that we need is to focus. We have a mind that is focused. We have a heart that is recipient, re ready to receive. And so, welcome again. And as I've said, Pastor Benford and Dorata will talk about the first part of the book of Colossians in chapter 1. And so, let us now pray. Let's humble ourselves before God. Father, we continue to honor you. We declare that you are God and you are sovereign. You are almighty, you are holy, you are righteous, you are good and merciful, and we honor you tonight. God, we humble ourselves before you and accept that we are sinners. And so we ask, Lord, that you forgive any iniquity you see in us, and we are sorry that we continue to sin against you. Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and help. Pastor Benpour and Dorata to facilitate the lesson about the Colossians chapter 1, first part. God, we thank you. We bless your name forever, O oh God. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 And so let's honor the Lord. Let's sing with the music team. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's just continue to stay in this atmosphere of worship with a heart of thankfulness because of what He has done upon the cross, the victory that He has won. So we thank Him for His love, we thank Him for His grace, that all that we are today, we will use it to bring glory and honor to His name. Every voice, let's just sing this out. I've tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. That you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never.
blessed evening everyone welcome to our wednesday bible study night i praise and thank the lord god that uh, i am here again i'm humbled and privileged to uh, speak to you this evening and i want to greet and uh, say thank you to my senior pastors uh, pastor dr godofredo ambat and pastor shirley ambat for uh, giving me this opportunity to be your speaker this evening in our Wednesday Bible study night. And also I would like to greet my uh, co-pastors, my co-servants in the Lord, uh, Pastor Doris Nadurata, Pastor Gosha Ambat, Pastor Alan Bakani, to all the primary leaders of uh, Bagasa Center in the UK, Ireland and Philippines. Uh, our families, our friends, our guests all over the world. I welcome you all and uh, a pleasant uh, evening to you all. And uh, today we will be studying the book of Colossians. And um, I have a scripture outline and uh, the first chapter will be uh divided into three sections so we will study about uh the book of colossians into uh, three parts and this is uh, the first half uh, of this study and uh, the outline is a uh, greeting and gratitude for uh, chapter 1 verses 1 to 8 and uh, the second part is the saints in the light which is uh, in verses 9 to 12. And then we will conclude in this first half of our study uh, in whom we have redemption in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Uh, but before that, we'll uh, have a quick prayer. Let's all bow our heads and uh, let us pray. Let's close our eyes. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, we humble ourselves before you, and we pray that you will give us uh, spiritual eyes, spiritual ears to hear, to see uh, your glory, your grace, your goodness, and your mercy through the word that we will uh, study this evening. Lord, I pray that those who will hear your message will be converted from their sins and will put their faith and trust and commitment to Christ, your Son. So, Lord, help us. Let the Holy Spirit do His mighty work, the work that only He can do. And fill us and anoint us, O Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. So, Colossae was an ancient city in the Lycus River Valley. It's about 100 miles east of the great uh, cosmopolitan capital city of Ephesus. It is located in the Roman province of Asia in present-day Turkey. Colossae was the smallest of uh, three cities in the Lycus Valley along with Laodicea and Hierapolis and each of these cities had Christian churches. Now Paul's letter to the Colossians is apparently written primarily to Gentile Christians like us and we observe that Paul's description of their conversion in terms more appropriate to Gentiles rather than to the Jews. And uh, Paul mentions the mystery revealed among the Gentiles. Now, the sins mentioned are more typical of Gentiles rather than of Jews. He includes neither Old Testament quotations nor any explicit reference to the law. Though Paul writes primarily to uh, Gentile Christians, the heresy that Paul was fighting seems to have Jewish roots. While Paul had probably passed uh, through Colossae on his second missionary journey, 
he didn't found the church at Colossae directly. Rather, it was founded by Epaphras, whom Paul mentions in this letter. Paul is in prison for the sake of the gospel, probably in Rome. And then Epaphras was the pastor of the Colossian church. He has come to Paul's place of imprisonment. In his letter to Philemon, Paul speaks of Epaphras as my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Colossians seems to have been written with two purposes in mind. And the first is to encourage and ground this relatively new Christian community. And to protect them from the seduction of false teachers, probably from a variety of uh, mystical Judaism that tended to criticize unfairly this Gentile Christian's faith in Christ in favor of the claims of Judaism. So let's go uh, to verse 1, chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. As in all his letters, Paul identifies himself in his greeting, an apostle of Christ Jesus. By this designation, he does not place himself in a class as the holder of an ecclesiastical office. His identity is in the commission he has received. The risen Christ has appeared to him and called him. His orders have come not from men nor through men, but from the Lord himself, who has commissioned Paul to speak and act in his name. Paul knew himself to be Christ's ambassador. And he was always ready to offer proof of his claim. Those signs of a true apostle. Healings, conversions, the establishment of churches. Such signs made it clear that the power of God was working in and through Apostle Paul. There is no consistent organizational structure in the New Testament. So there is really no question of whether we have uh, deacons or elders and whether those terms designate lay or clergy people or whether we have uh, presbyters or bishops. Rather, the question is, do we have a church that recognizes affirms and seeks to equip persons called by God to minister in a set-apart, representative kind of way. Maybe an even more important question than that is, do we who are ordained to bear the fruit of ministry, which are signs of a true apostle, and do we operate out of the empowering, self-conscious conviction that we are apostles of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God. Paul's burning awareness of his being specially called as an apostle did not make him class conscious. In fact, his bold affirmation of the gospel shattered the boundaries and barriers of class and position. Especially this was so in the church. There is tenderness, intimacy, warmth, and the passing sense of belonging and family in his reference to Timothy, our brother, and his address that brings us to Verse 2, let's read. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you 
and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren is Paul's favorite designation for his companion Christians. He uses this designation in all his letters. There is no chauvinism here as we may need to guard against in our day. Sisters and brothers were in Paul's mind. He made clear the dynamic power of women in the early church and in the spreading of the gospel. Louis, Eunice, Lydia, Nympha, Prisca, and Julia are all linked with Tychicus, Achaeus, Fortunatus, Apollos, Hermes, Nereus, and Olympus to make up the family. That is the way Paul thought of the church as a family. For that reason, he seems little interested in the organization of the church, the natural organic unity of the family is more important than the way it may organize itself to function. The church needs to remember who she is. A family. In a family, the well-being of every member is important. And members of the family should be willing to sacrifice themselves on behalf of the other members. The church is a special kind of family. It is a fellowship of saints and saints in the Bible are the believers in Christ Jesus. As an adjective, the word means dedicated or a bit stronger word, consecrated. Those to whom Paul wrote were saints, not because they are distinguished from others by their moral and spiritual qualities, but because they have received and responded to a divine calling. They are set apart by belonging to Christ. So brethren, you have received a divine calling and you are set apart because you belong to Christ. Amen. That is our identity as Christians. We are saints because we belong to Christ. We have been called and we are to be faithful to that call. Amen. Whether lay or clergy, ordained or unordained, deacons or elders, presbyters or bishops, we are brothers and sisters, members of the family. Amen. Is that an amen? So we therefore celebrate who we are. Along with naming who we are, we need to celebrate who we are at the grat at the heart of celebration is gratitude here is a description of who we are as christians at least who we should be which we celebrate that brings us to verses 3 and 4 let's read we give thanks to god we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. So Paul gives thanks to God the Father for your faith in Christ Jesus. Paul is the champion of justification or salvation by grace through faith. This was the heartbeat of his preaching. We will never fathom the depths of this great truth. We can only celebrate it and rejoice. Amen. 
Paul is thankful for the Colossians because he has heard of their love for all the saints. This is something to this is something to celebrate. So the Colossians had love for one another and Paul was very thankful. Do we have love for one another? Amen. Amen. So let's go to verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Hope was the final characteristic Paul name because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Now here is the great triad of Christian virtues describing the Christian style. Faith, hope, and love. This abide though all else may perish. This passage is a unique expression of the three elements and defines what Paul means by them. Faith is directed to Christ and is in Christ. Love is to and for the brethren. Hope is for the coming of full salvation. There is also a unique expression of the connection of faith and love with hope. Interestingly, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven is not a reward for our faith and love. Rather, the hope that is ours is the source of faith and love. Now, let's go to verses 5 and 8. And these are a compacted affirmation of the power of the gospel and its witnesses. First, the witness. You also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Too often, we fall into the trap of thinking that the gospel has moved across from the face of the earth through the zeal, passion, and commitment of superstars like Paul. But this is not so. To be sure, there are occasional fiery beacons who light up the sky of history like Augustine, St. Francis, Luther, and Wesley. But if they were alone in their witness, the sky of history would be deprived of the luminous light of the gospel. So the sky is lighted only because of thousands of lesser stars, Epaphras, Onesimus, Eunice, Aquila, and several others in the many churches that Paul planted. You can extend the list to include those names through whom the gospel came to you as a lively experience which set you on the journey to and in a life committed in Christ. In his letters, Paul mentions 14 fellow workers, four fellow prisoners of war, two fellow soldiers, two fellow slaves, and one close companion. This is enough for us to know that Paul knew that he was not in a solo ministry, nor could he provide adequate witness to win the world for Christ which was his passionate dream. No less than Paul, Epaphras was an apostle, a messenger or witness. And what are the marks of an apostle? Number one, an experience of the risen Christ. Number two, a sense of divine call. Number three, a demonstration of the signs of an 
apostle. Then there is fourth, which upholds the others, especially the second. And this is the belief that preparation for apostleship begins at birth. With this understanding of apostleship, why do we continue to argue about apostolic succession or hierarchical ministry in our discussions of uh, church unity? Are our churches having apostolic experiences right now? Do we recognize the church's worship and are we witnesses or witnessing the risen Christ? From the church and in the church, do we sense a divine call? Are there gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in the common life of the brethren? Is the fruit of the Holy Spirit growing from church fellowship and ministry? You see, this is what ministry is about. Not a hierarchy of order, but a fellowship in which all the people are the apostolate. All members are being given the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to minister. We need to get our identity straight and affirm that we are the whole people of God. The Epaphrases and the Pauls. Amen. Paul not only affirms the witness, he affirms the power of the gospel. At the time of this writing, Paul's words must have seemed a wild exaggeration. And this brings us to verse 6. Which has come to you as it as also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. The church then was only a tiny handful of ragtag individuals. They were almost unnoticed. Uh, in a great empire. But Paul affirmed the power of it and the seeds were being sown and the harvest would be bountiful. And two words describe the gospel's power as Paul affirmed it. It is universal and effective. The gospel must be local. Paul addressed the saints in Christ at Colossae. There is always the local setting. Our own environment where the gospel is to be proclaimed and lived out. We are always at Colossae or Ireland or London or Philippines put down in some particular place to spend the particular days of our lives. But the gospel we live and proclaim at Colossae is universal. Paul wanted the Colossians to uh, remember that the gospel builds a worldwide community and the saints at Colossae are a part of this great whole community. There is much power that would be released in our little places if we would remember the universality of the gospel. Universal and effective. Paul constantly celebrates the effects of the gospel bearing fruit and growing his metaphor is that of a tree which bursts fruit at the end of a season and puts forth the buds for the next. The gospel bursts fruit 
in the conduct of believers and subsequently by their witness and by winning new converts. The bearing fruit and the growing cycle repeats itself over and over. The guarantee of growth is a surety because the gospel is God's grace and He will bring the increase. Remember, Paul planted, Apollos watered, and then God gave the increase. God will uh, bring the multiplication. Amen. Let's now go to the saints in the light, the kingdom in which we live. Let's read verses 9 to 12 of chapter 1. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Amen. With verse 9, Paul begins to share with his readers the prayer of intercession he has made for them. Even in his praying, he raises the question of identity. He does so by offering thanks for who we are, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Now, the illustration here is powerful and suggestive. The contrast between light and darkness is common with Paul and also with, with John. And it was more than figurative. There is here a reference to the poisonous doctrines with which Paul was dealing during that time, as well as to the common belief that Certain angelic beings had fallen or had been expelled from a higher world and had created this material world in which they were in control. And this led to the Gnostic view of the evil of that which is material and thus to the false teaching of the non-humanity of Jesus. The widespread idea which Paul also seemingly held was that people are subject to the powers of the universe, the principalities, the rulers of darkness. But by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has overcome these powers and rescued us from their oppression. And two very important lessons are found here. One, there are two kingdoms, light and darkness, flesh and spirit, good and evil. We have been rescued from the darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Amen. This is what Paul wanted to convey. That as believers, we must not feel impotent or powerless in a technological society. That we are not helpless 
in the grips of mechanical law or even uh, scientific acceptance or um, determinism. How often do we give in to the overwhelming feeling that we have no control, that everything is determined by heredity, environment, natural powers, economic and social forces. How evident and ominous is the power of sin. We move along as best as we can, but we are being thrown around. But we are being thrown around like ping pong balls in a mountain stream. That's why Paul says, no. We have been delivered into a kingdom of light, of freedom. We have a destiny about which we can decide. And we have access to the power of Christ to live against the tide of this determinism. We are saints of the light. And the darkness will never prevail against the light. Amen. The second lesson in this identification of Paul is that we are now residents of the new kingdom. And it is not something that is ours in some distant future. It is because we have been already removed from a world which is subject to evil forces into a realm in which Christ is king. He is Lord and he alone has ultimate authority over us. With what confidence we may live if we appropriate this truth experientially. No darkness can overcome us. No power can overwhelm us. No experience can completely devastate us. Sin cannot hold sway in our lives. We belong to Christ. His is the kingdom. His is the power. And His is the glory. We have been qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Amen. Hallelujah. And then we have the power to live as saints in the light. And from this passage, we learn that prayer at its best makes two great requests. Number one, for the discernment of God's will. And number two, for the power to perform God's will. God's will is... He has a plan for the universe and for our lives. Discerning God's will is our task. And that is not easy. It is a surrender of our identity as human beings and a blasphemy against God to give in to the pain, hopelessness, and helplessness we feel, the endless doubts that haunt us by passing through our struggles, conflict, pain, disillusionment, and despair, and with the superficial affirmation that it's God's will. You know, this is like a straw bridge which will not hold as we pass over or pass through the paralyzing depths to which we are often plunged. Such shallow, superficial words are empty and do not affirm the almightiness of God as we presume they do. Nor does such an easy slogan authenticate our faith. The will of God is often enshrouded in darkness, clouded in ambiguity. Silence, as well as speaking, marks his communication with us. In prayer, 
we struggle to learn to discern God's will. We talk, we listen, we ponder scripture, we reflect, we wait, and graciously, the response comes. Not according to our timetable, nor in the form and mode of our design, but in God's timing and in His way. That is one of the two great requests that should preoccupy our praying for the discernment of God's will. The second request is for power to perform God's will. Discerning God's will is only one part of the hard stuff of prayer. We know far more than we do. Two things are essential. The will to do and the power to do. The line between the will to do and the power to do may not merit such a clear distinction. I draw the line to underscore the need for power beyond our own human resources and the willingness to acknowledge that need. The greatest problem in life is not to know what to do, but to do it, to have the will and the power to act according to what we know. Paul uses a sweet phrase to name our need and to affirm the power that is available to us. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. And then we go to the being worthy of the Lord. Overarching these two great requests at the heart of our prayer is the end to which we pray. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Prayer is practical. It is not an escape from reality. The end of prayer is not spiritual. We do not seek a, a mystical communion alone with God. In prayer, we struggle with being in the world as those who walk worthy of the Lord. As Christians in prayer, we are looking for the power not to be translated to some third heaven, but to be made transparent witnesses of Christ's glory in us, bearing fruit of the Holy Spirit. Paul is talking about holiness, a holiness that is personal and social. The person who would walk worthy of the Lord boldly orders his life in obedience to God. Seeking what is pleasing to God. Thus doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with the Lord. Now we know that we can never live a life fully pleasing to Christ if the measure of that is moral purity, untainted ethical performance, sinless perfection. Paul is talking about our affections, what we deeply desire, our directions, what we truly seek, our disposition, the set of our wills. He is talking about the shape and substance of our commitment. The question is, are we passionately eager to please God? Amen? Are we passionately eager to please God? Now let's go to the result of obedience. Patience, long-suffering, and joy are needs and characteristics of those who walk worthy of the Lord. 
we focus on obedience. And the Holy Spirit gives us patience and enables us to be long-suffering. Joy is both the result of our obedient living and the witness that we are saints in the light. These three, patience, long-suffering, and joy, are the greatest gifts that are ours when we are empowered with all power. Obviously, these are gifts, the result of Christ's glorious might working within us. Patience and long-suffering are twin words with a slight but significant difference in their use here. Long-suffering, in other translations, endurance is the refusal to be intimidated by hard times. Patience is the refusal to be upset by perverse people. How strong the distinction should be made is questionable. But the point is that there are difficulties through which we pass for which we can find no relief or release. We need the power to endure. The promise is that in every situation, adequate power to suffer through and to remain whole and triumphant can be ours through the Holy Spirit. Likewise, there are people with whom we live and to whom we relate who will try us, spitefully use us, scorn us, some deliberately, others unconsciously, they are dull to our feelings, callous to our needs, always demanding, but never giving. And so we need patience in relationships. We need power to endure rejection and injury. We need the capacity to keep on loving, forgiving, and accepting when all human responses are spent and natural sources of goodwill are drained from souls. The outward manifestation of the inner grace of the Lord Jesus is joy. Joy flows from grace. It is a distinctively Christian quality. It is very significant to note that it is constantly linked in the New Testament with hardship and suffering. There is nothing superficial about it. It is in the category of blessed. The benediction of Jesus upon those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are merciful, who are pure in heart, and make peace with those who are persecuted, scorned, and falsely accused. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8.10 Now let's go to In Whom We Have Redemption. Verses 13 and 14, chapter 1 of Colossians. Let's read. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Not only our identity but the identity of Christ is defined, described, and affirmed, especially in this first chapter, but also throughout Colossians. He is the one in whom we have redemption. 
In the closing of his prayer in verse 12, Paul announced the kingdom in which we live. We live in this kingdom as saints in the light. He builds on this theme in verse 13. We are delivered by Christ and translated to a new kingdom. Paul describes the entry of the Gentiles into the church, our entry into the Christian life, with an image of the defeated people of a nation being taken to a new land and later being liberated. It was a common practice in the ancient world that when one nation was defeated by another, people living in exile in that now conquered nation would often be liberated to return to their homeland. This imagery or illustration would be familiar to the people in a Roman province such as Colossae. Paul gives specific meaning to the metaphor. As God had rescued the Hebrew people from oppression in Egypt, so now he has rescued the new Israel from the dark principalities and powers which rule the present world order. Once exiled and without hope, these sojourners from the promise are settled in the kingdom of Christ. Amen. Verse 13 is a continued development of verse 12. The Father has qualified us to live in the new kingdom. Note clearly that we do not qualify ourselves. We are qualified by God. Only by His grace can we enter the new kingdom. Faith is the path we walk into that new land. Our redemption is in the cross. Christ's death for us. We have redemption through His blood. Just as clear is the assertion that we are delivered. To get this clear in our mind, let it saturate our total beings is precisely our struggle in the Christian life. We preoccupy ourselves anxiously with what we ought to be and do. Thus, we are constantly stirring up all sorts of passions, inflaming these passions with new power. Our energy is wasted as we focus on our efforts rather than releasing ourselves to be empowered by Christ within us. Christ, who is now our Lord, has won the victory over sin and death. That is not our battle. He draws our whole being into this victory, giving us a complete resurrection as persons. We have been raised with Christ. That is in Colossians 3.1. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3. 3. Amen. The powerful meaning of this work of God through Christ is best seen as we look at the specific things that have been done for us by Him in whom we have redemption. Therefore, we have been transferred from darkness to light. In the dark, we cannot see things as they really are, nor can we see where we are going. So there are two facets of truth in this image. In Christ, we have perception. 
we can see things as they are. A tourist in the National Museum in Washington, standing before a masterpiece, said in a kind of a snide tone, I don't see anything in that. Another tourist with a kind of inspired genius whispered in reply, Don't you wish you could? In Christ's kingdom of light, we have perception. We can see things as they are. Sift the wheat from the shaft. Decipher the real from the imagined. The authentic from the spiritual. The other facet of truth in this image of being transformed from darkness to light is that in Christ, we have direction, perception to see things as they are, direction to see and know where we are going. Have we a more desperate need than direction? We are no longer slaves but free. Amen. The Greek word for redemption also carries the same meaning for ransoming and deliverance. It is the word that was used for the liberation of a slave and for the buying back of something which is the which is in the power of someone else. It is next to impossible for someone who have never been imprisoned or a slave in the literal sense or actually who was put behind bars to sense the depth of this image. The fourth verse captures the difference of being inside and free. Free and freed from all the passions, forces, influences, habits, and relationships that have us in bondage. The list is almost endless. For example, neurotic fear of the future that makes us impotent. Jealousy that breaks out in rage. Destroying someone we love. Or smolders within to destroy our capacity to truly love. Indecisiveness that immobilizes us. Prejudice that fences us into a narrow plot of acquaintances and robs us of the richness of friendship. Ambition that numbs us to being feelingly human and drives us to trample over the needs of others. Sexual lust, which, like ambition, is insensitive to the needs of others, allowing us to use persons as playthings and handle the precious gift of sexuality with self-indulgent, grasping hands. The passionate drive for immediate gratification and satisfaction that turns the holy into the profane. Or we could turn the list into the kind Paul makes in Colossians 3 verses 5 to 8. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. In this you yourselves once walked when you live in them. It does not take much probing to locate the chains from which we have been freed by Christ. And it does not take much perception to be aware that we can become slaves again. So we stay conscious. We stay conscious of and celebrate the fact that we are no longer slaves, but free. We have been transferred from 
condemnation to forgiveness. In every letter, Paul sang the joy of this experience. Like in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The cross is our proof that God has accepted us and no power in the universe can separate us from His love. We are no longer under the power of Satan but under the power of God. We have been delivered by God into the kingdom of the Son of His love. The forces of evil affect our lives in a variety of ways. But be sure this the power of Satan controls us only as we give him authority. As residents of the kingdom of the Son of God's love, evil has no control over us, over our lives. As long as we say no to evil, and say yes to Christ. Repeat. Say no to evil. And say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. So we know who we are. Saints in the light. And we know who Christ is. The one in whom we have redemption. Throughout Colossians, the identity question as the key to our life in Christ repeats over and over with the resounding affirmation of the all-sufficient Christ as the under-moving theme. We specifically turn to that theme in the next half of our study uh, next Wednesday. So, as we end uh, this Bible study, I encourage everyone, if you are still in bondage or are still in the grips of the power of the darkness, the rulers or the principalities, I would like to pray for you. Let us declare that we have been redeemed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and His resurrection. We are no longer slaves, but free. We are no longer captives of the enemy, but we have been brought into the light, to the kingdom of God in Christ Jesus and that is our identity and we will continue to proclaim that but as I said we have to say no to Satan and say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ Amen let's pray Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for all those who are still being imprisoned and being held captive by the enemy. Lord, we have learned that our identity is in you through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you will silence the enemy, bind the hands of the enemy, demolish every stronghold, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus and by his blood. We are overcomers. We are more than conqueror, conquerors through your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, help us. 
let the Holy Spirit fight the battle for us to overcome this principalities and rulers of darkness and lord we believe and we declare that we were brought into the light and we can see things as they are the blindness in us was already removed by the blood of your son jesus christ so lord help us to say no to satan and say yes to our lord and savior jesus christ and our identity is that we are your children that we are your beloved sons and daughters and we belong to your kingdom we belong to your family So, Lord, dismiss us with your grace, with your goodness, with your mercy. Protect us from the grips of sin, Lord, as we come to you with a humble heart. And we repent of all our sins. And we will put our faith and trust In the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. It is in His name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you very much for listening and uh, tuning in. I hope to see you on uh, Wednesday, the next. And we will conclude the first chapter of Uh, the letter to the Colossians. So, um, thank you very much again. I will see you soon. God bless you. Jesus loves you. Bye-bye.